P.E. Trap asks, is there a big difference in accuracy between power meters? Yeah, there is. Uh, they can vary considerably. Well, let's go back and talk about what power is. I guess maybe a starting point for this discussion. Power is made up of two things. It's the force you apply to the pedal. When you, when you push down on the pedal, force that's being applied is being measured and the velocity. In other words, how fast the pedal is going around with your cadence. Those two things determine what power is. So power equals force times velocity. Measuring these is not simple. Um, this, this, is what, this is what power meters are all about, is measuring these two variables. Let's talk about, let's talk about velocity first. That, that's the one that's the trickiest in, some, in many ways. Velocity has to do with uh, how fast the pedal is, is going around in a circle. The circle doesn't change, but there are things that change within that circle while you're pedaling. One of those things is the pedal is going, is rocking back and forth this way as it's going around. And also we're getting some, some shim movement laterally, medially, as the pedal is going around and the pedal is pausing slightly and speeding up at other points in the pedal stroke. So we've got all these things that are going on in, in the pedal stroke. And uh, so measuring velocity becomes rather difficult. The way most companies solve this problem is they estimate what the velocity was. One revolution is, is used as the, as, the, as the measure of velocity. So how long did it take to make that one revolution? Well, it's not quite that simple. There's because of all these other things that are going on, the, the power and velocity is actually um, being changed throughout the pedal stroke. And so what, what has been, what um, uh, Favero has done with the osteoma, uh, it really comes down to this gyroscope that's in the, uh, in the uh, osteoma device. Um, what's going on there is it's, it's measuring tiny little segments of this circle that as the pedal is going around. Uh, Favero refers to that instantaneous angular velocity uh, or IAV, and that's what makes their product so um, accurate is the fact that they're measuring, able to measure velocity uh, to a much smaller degree than what the other companies are doing. So it, it produces a much more you know, accurate um, uh, power reading because of the two variables, force versus velocity. If we get velocity right, instead of estimating it, we get a much more accurate number every time we ride our bikes. Me, him, her. The question is, is your FTP the most important measure? My friends who race tell me it's the, it's the ability to do short efforts. Well, your friends are, are really somewhat right. It, it, it's based on a short effort. You're only doing a short test, which we'll come back to, I'm sure, later on with questions about how do you discover your FTP. But it's a, it's a relatively short effort to determine this number, but the number really reflects something that's more like an hour uh, long. So it's, it's not quite as short as perhaps what the person is leading to believe. But I would suggest that the, probably the, the greatest benefit for FTP is for long steady events, um, time trials, uh, triathlons, uh, events that are relatively steady FTP is a great number, but if you're doing, if you're a road racer, for example, and you do a lot of uh, uh, criteriums or, or uh, races on the, on the road, uh, one of the things you'll discover is that uh, the FTP doesn't do you much good when there's a breakaway and you're trying to catch them. Uh, that's a nice number, but you really need to be more aware also of your VO2 max which is a much higher number. It, and it's really derived from something like about a five minute test. So you do an all, all out five minute effort. And that will give you an idea of what your VO2 max power is. And that's critical to your success in road racing and criteriums. And also if, if, if you're a spreader, um, FTP doesn't really mean all that much. It gets you to the finish line, which is important, but you know, Cavendish doesn't work on his FTP to become a better sprinter. He works on sprints. He does things which are in the neighborhood of five seconds. And that's also a good number to know if you're, if you're a road cyclist. What's, what's my five-second power, eight-second power? What, when I'm doing down to the, you know, to the very end of the race and it comes down to a sprint, and this is my role on the, on the team, 
then you know, you've got to know how what kind of power you can put out. And that's that's the number also. So there actually are lots of numbers. FTP is the most widely uh, accepted and understood and most widely used by far. But the other numbers are also quite valuable to you, depending on what your uh, event goal is. Uh, what's the best hill workout session? Well, here I go again. It always comes down to it depends. It depends on what you want to get out of the workout. If you want to improve your VO2 max, your aerobic capacity, which is a gigantic contributor to your performance in cycling. If you want to do that, I'd suggest something like doing intervals on a hill for perhaps the intervals may be 30 seconds to, to four minutes in duration. Um, and they'd be done at an intensity of roughly around 120% of your FTP. So if you know your FTP, take 120% of that. And that gives us a very ballpark figure of what type of training you're going to have to do to, uh, uh, with that type of interval to get a, a benefit in terms of your performance. Now, uh, I mentioned a while ago that uh, five minute power is one way of estimating your VO2 max power. Well, that's, that's one of the things you could do before doing this hill workout. After you've gotten warmed up uh, and you're ready to go, do an all out five minute effort and see what your average power was when you get done. That's the power you would need to do for those type of intervals. So 30 seconds to four minutes in duration, taking one-to-one -one recovery afterwards. So if you did a, a two-minute interval, you'd take a two-minute recovery after that interval. Um, if you did a three-minute interval, it'd be a three-minute recovery after the interval. Now, if you're doing it on a hill, you'll come down a lot faster than, than you went up. So if you did a two-minute hill um, a climb at that intensity, you're going to have to come down the hill and then ride circles or something before you start up the next time around. So the idea is you're, you're trying to get in these intervals, making sure you get a one-to-one -one recovery um, about uh, the same amount of time it took to go up the hill. Now that's, that's VO2 max. You could also be working on your FTP. We've mentioned FTP many times in these uh, talks. Uh, FTP is done at about uh, on a long, longer hill. Now we're talking something like about, Oh, let's say six to 20 minutes climbing. Um, and that six to 20 minutes would be done at intensity, which is roughly 90 to 100% of your FTP. So you're going to be climbing right around FTP or slightly below it. And the intervals are going to be long, six to 20 minutes. And the recoveries are going to be shorter than they were for the VO2 max. VO2 max, we're trying to get a pretty full recovery before we do it again. Not complete, but pretty full. For FTP, we're trying to shorten the recovery. So the FTP recovery may be something on the order of 50% of, uh, of the work of, of the interval, the climb. So if you climbed in six minutes, we're going to start the next one roughly around three minutes after you finish the first one. That, that means you're coming down the hill rather quickly and you're going to turn around and go right back up again. So it, it's a much shorter recovery in that case. But that kind of a workout is great for, for improving uh, FTP. Um, and so the recovery time is different. Uh, the durations are different. The intensities are different. So you really have to decide if you're going to do hill workouts, what is it I want to get out of this hill workout? Do I want to become, uh, increase my aerobic capacity, my VO2 max, or do I want to increase my FTP? Now realize that one workout is not going to achieve that. One workout is minuscule in terms of what your achievement was. So you're going to, have to do that many, many times over the course of, weeks to bring the advantage to bring the benefits that you're trying to achieve by um, by doing the hill repeats the underbar puerto rican underbar cyclist uh, he asks how can you correct left right leg imbalance well the duo is is a great uh, tool for determining this you've got if you're measuring both legs you really know what's going on with with uh, your left and right legs in comparison. And if the numbers are, are greater than, let's say, 45, 55, like your 45 left leg or, or, or 44, down to 40, something really ridiculous, and your right leg is 55 up to 60, that, that is, that's way too much. If you're within the range of 45, 55, I wouldn't be too concerned with it. You might take a look at things like your shoes and, and um, how comfortable you are on the bike and, and a lot of little things like that. But if it is outside that range of 45, 55, I would suggest, first of all, seeing a, a, a bike fitter 
someone who can take a look at how your bike is set up, because that's really one of the, the uh, most common reasons why people have a leg imbalance is because of just the way their bike is set up. First of all, we're not all exactly the same left leg and right leg. Uh, we have obviously have discrepancies between them. One leg is a little bit stronger than the other, or you have one leg which is slightly longer or shorter than the other. And that's going to affect uh, the balance between uh, left and right legs. So consequently, having a bike fitter look at you and see if he or she can uh, make adjustments, you may get the thing to working well just by having done that. And, and you really should be doing this anyway. I, I When I coach athletes, I always have them get a bike fit every year, even if, even if it's the same bike they've had for multiple years, just because things change. Um, we become more flexible, less flexible, um, things are going on all the time with our body and we forget that we made a little bitty change by moving our stems a little bit, um, six months ago. And so by getting a bike fit, uh, once a year, you're kind of making sure that your bike is really set up to, uh, to keep your, your left or right balance and, and other things about, you know, your, your aerodynamics on the bike and power and so forth is also going to be influenced by this. If you get that done and you still find you have an imbalance between left and right legs, then I suggest the next stage is to see a physio, physical therapist. You may have something going on which is um, beyond the realm of, um, of a fitter, something that's more along the lines of a, of a medical um, examination to take a look at it. And if the problem still persists, you may be referred to a podiatrist. And so we, we've got this long list of things the people we can see who can help us. But the starting point always for a cyclist when you've got anything like this going on is a bike fitter. That's always the key to uh, getting things set up correctly.